Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. And that mission has led me to create the Become a Better Investor community. In that community, you get access to our global asset allocation strategies and stock portfolios, our investment research, weekly live sessions, and the risk reduction lessons I've learned from more than 500 guests. Go to myworstinvestmentever.com to claim your spot now. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest Lance DePew. Lance, are you ready to join the mission? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Nice I to am. see you. Yes, mm-hmm. and you too. I'm looking forward to this chat. And uh, let me introduce you to the audience. Lance has over 30 years of equity research, portfolio management, and corporate finance experience. Since 2000, he has co-managed Rylai Capital Partners, a global multi-strategy absolute return hedge fund. Between 1994 and 2007, Lance was a portfolio manager and director of equity research for Leading Assets United, the premier asset management firm dedicated to both public and private equity investments in the Thailand market. Lance received his MBA in finance at the Anderson Graduate School of Management at UCLA and is currently a member of the investment committee for the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Lance, take a minute and tell us about the unique value that you bring to this world. (laughs) Well, I don't know if I bring unique value. uh, I've been in the industry for a long time, uh, well over 30 years. And uh, I actually wanted to start off and my goal initially was to be a, a jazz musician like my father. But I realized early on that I didn't have enough uh, talent to really you know, make it uh, to really be successful as musicians. So I transitioned ultimately to finance and economics. I really early on found that I had a love for for finance and economics, and uh, it led me down this path. And I've been portfolio manager um, again for for over thirty years. So mm-hmm. I love it. Uh, it it gets me. I'm I'm always interested, always learning, and it's never uh, there's never a dull moment. Mm. Never a dull moment. Um, I remember, you know, we met originally in Thailand many years ago when you were living here. And I always, you know, saw you as a very thoughtful analyst, fund manager, investor. And I wonder for a young person listening to, you know, to this and thinking about, uh, you know, for me, I talk a lot about a sell side analyst, you know, what's the career like and what's that like? But for you, I kind of consider you a, a, a buy side a portfolio analyst or portfolio manager but you're also a pretty strong analyst. Maybe you could just give an idea of like why you like that career or what what does that career bring to you? Well, when you're on the buy side, you you know, it's really your own intellectual curiosity and uh, and the effort you put into analyzing companies. It's not, I don't want to be rude towards people on the sell side, but you know, it's not a kind of a used car salesmanship type of role where you're trying to pitch ideas and stocks and generate commissions. You know, running a hedge fund, it's it's all about performance, right? At the end of the day, if you don't lose less in the market, if you don't generate returns in absolute in an absolute sense, you're not going to get paid. So you have to take that insight and the hard work, and it has to be translated into real gains. Um, mm. And you know, that's the only time you get to share in the spoils is when you when you actually generate real returns for your investors. So or there's an alignment of interest, which you don't quite get on the on the sell side. Definitely. So I prefer being on the buy side and I've actually never been on the sell side, mm. uh, but I, I love being on the buy side. I wouldn't I wouldn't want a, any other career. And how would you describe, you know, your your you talk, your strategy is global multi strategy absolute return. What is what do those three things mean to someone who doesn't know much about, you know, investing? Well, uh, you know, a lot of time, a lot of funds uh, are focused on a particular market. So you might be a, a US growth manager, or a biotech manager concentrated in the US or a, a single country fund in Japan or China or Thailand, for that matter. So we and we do truly invest globally, uh, our portfolio currently 
doesn't have a huge allocation to non-U.S. equities, which has actually been a, a good thing, given mm -hmm. the outperformance of the U.S. market and, and the U.S. dollar in, in recent years. Uh, but so again, we do invest and we do look at opportunities globally. Um, we are value investors, so we're not, we're definitely not growth managers. We're not technical analysts. We are looking for undervalued opportunities in the market. Mm -hmm. And we don't shy away from small cap opportunities, big cap or large, you know, it doesn't, you know, the whole range. We're not right. pigeonholing ourselves into any one category of stock or industry or, or, in a, from a geo, uh, geographic standpoint, we're, we're looking at every and all, you know, all opportunities. Yep. But as and far like, as an absolute return, sorry, yep, an absolute ahead. return sense, what we try to do, and I like to, I don't know if I coined the phrase, but we like to look at things in, in, in there's fixed income. We like to look at fixed equity. So I like to, to create more structured returns on our underlying equity investments. And most of the time that's done through options. So, you know, a lot of your investor or your listeners are familiar with covered call strategies. So a lot of our underlying long positions are coupled with, 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 uh, with calls, with long, with short uh, call options. And that creates more of a structured return environment. It can, it, it can obviously cap some of your upside potential, but it also reduces your downside risk. And so we like to create equity returns that I would, I guess what I'm what ultimately we're getting at is I would prefer a a stable, you know, 10% return than a very volatile 12% return. And I think a lot of our investors feel that way as well. Mm. So we do that through the structured equity um, uh, investments that we make. So let's make it simple for a, a listener who doesn't understand that type of stuff. The first thing is you identify a stock that you like and you've done your research and you think this is going to do better than the market. I think it's going to do really well over the next, I don't know, three years, let's say. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so a typical long only investor would say, I'm just going to buy that and hope that everything goes. And when it collapses by 20 or 30%, I'm going to buy more. And when it collapses by 40%, I'm going to buy more. <clears throat> exactly. but, but there's a risk, you know, at sometimes they come back from that fall, other times they don't. So I believe when you talk about your strategy, what you're saying is that you're using an option to truncate the downside to say, okay, I'm only going to, I'm, I'm not going to capture all of that downside. I'm going to give up a little bit of the upside, but I'm going to protect myself on the downside. Is that, does that describe what you're doing? Uh, yeah, more or less. I mean, there are different ways to, to do this. And so we have many different approaches and it depends on the stock and a lot of, there's a lot of dynamics involved. Mm. But let's just take a simple example. Let's just say we feel a stock is is fairly to undervalued at eighty dollars a share, and we buy a share, uh, you know, buy a you know hundreds of shares of at mm. eighty dollars. We might write the one hundred strike calls of that company, and let's say we get five dollars a premium. If in that very simple scenario, we bought the shares at 80, the shares can move up to $100 and we participate in all those gains. Uh, if the stock pays dividends, we receive any and all dividends. But if the shares move above 100, we are capped at the $100 value. But remember, we received the $5 of income by selling this call, by giving up mm. part of that, that upside. So in the event that the shares do drop, let's say they drop from, from $80 to 75, we've essentially still are at a break-even level because we received the $5 from writing the call. So it's that sort of approach where we're, we're giving up some of the upside potential, but it creates some downside protection that we wouldn't otherwise have. And so when you take into account dividends, you can write calls with different maturities, Mm. Uh, different strike prices. You, we oftentimes don't write calls against our entire position. That way, let's say if the shares double or triple, we're still participating in some portion of those gains. So it's how we structure these investments with these options, calls, and puts in such a manner. It creates more of this tailored return that that our our investors are are are, are hope for, you know they expect from us. And would I be correct in saying if if we think about a crude way of handling a price fall for a trader. They may say, okay, I bought it at 80. If it goes to 70, I'm out. 
Now, a long only fund manager generally doesn't do that. And therefore, you don't want to have some sort of instrument or stop loss that's getting you out of the stock. What you're trying to do is cushion the blow by saying, okay, if it goes down to 70, I've already, I'm down 10, but we got the five in income. And therefore, we've cushioned the blow of the fall. Is that, would that describe what you're doing? Exactly. Now we may decide to buy more shares at that lower price level. We may buy back the call option and write a new call option at 90 or 85 because the shares have gone down. We profit on the first call and we write a new call. call. It's limiting our, our upside to a, a greater degree, but it's still, it's generating income. And to the extent that we can de-risk our, our investments over time, it just increases our ability to, to, to earn positive returns on investment. That's really what our investors are looking for. Yep. They want us to earn absolute returns on our investment. We want to protect against the downside and we want to generate positive returns. And our investors aren't looking to, you know, shoot, they're like, you know, take a baseball analogy. You've got baseball players that are shooting for the fences. We're more like, we try to be the Rod Carew. And maybe this will you know, go over the head of a number of your listeners. But, you know, Rod Carew was known for just hitting singles and doubles and just had a high batting average. And that's what we're trying to always do. Always get on base. Don't have to you know, hit a home run. We just want to get on base. We don't want to strike out. We don't have to home run, but we want to get on base. Got it. And one other thing, I know that you, you are interested in both large companies and small companies, companies in America, companies outside. Uh, mm -hmm. Does it matter where the size of the company or where you're buying the company to as whether you can get access to these type of hedging strategies, or is it pretty much available for every 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 stock everywhere? It's actually it is actually difficult to do that unless you're a large enough fund. Uh, it's it's not always possible to to write option contracts in in other countries. So. Mm. Uh, all of our option trading does take place in the U.S., but there are a number of foreign companies that are actively traded in the U.S. So you can write options against certain foreign companies. But again, we are we are global and we are multi-strategy and we're value investors. So if it's a Norwegian company that we feel is undervalued, we'll buy those shares. And if there's no uh, options, there's no options, and we'll monitor it as a you know separate investment. And through dividends or other means, we'll we'll be looking to protect and, and to, you know, see a, a decent return on investment over time. So it has to really, it has to make sense and yep. options help <clears throat> things make sense. But a lot of times we are just purely naked long. Mm. It's not always coupled with options. Got it. Well, I mean, I think this is why uh, I'm happy to have you on the show because you've got a lot of experience in this area. And I believe you are going to share some stories about stocks. So now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Well, I'd say I was thinking long and hard about this because obviously as an investor, it's been in the business for, for many, many years. I, I do want to point out that my very first investment, the very first day I invested was I bought a few hundred shares of Bank of America and it was the uh, the the... Black Monday in, I think it was in October of 1987. That was yep. my very first purchase of, of any company on a stock market because I, I saw in the news, like the stock market is cratering. And so I went out and I called my broker and I was like, or I don't even know if I had a broker at the time, but somehow I was able to call someone and I was able to put, I was a young kid. I placed my order for two or 300 shares. And I think the shares were trading at eight or $9 a share. And I still own those shares to this day. But uh, ah, anyways, that was my first investment. But as far as my worst investment, um, I'm not sure if it is actually the worst, but it's among the worst, uh, would probably be my investment in a company called Transocean. Mm. Ticker symbol is RIG, RIG. Um, we in, I invested both personally, but in my fund, we first established a position in RIG on January 30th of 2006. So it was quite a, quite a while ago. And I was looking back at our records and the purchase was made at $80.35 a share. That was our very first investment. Uh, now we ultimately in, exited the position, or fully exited the position on October 7th of 2020. And we, the last sale took place at less than a dollar a share. So yeah, 
doesn't take a genius to realize that was not a good investment. Now, I will say that along the way, we sold shares at higher levels than the $1. Uh, we received dividends um, uh, during a portion of the that, that holding period. Company was uh, flush with cash for, for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And we did write call options, which many of those call options ended up uh, expiring worthless. And then we wrote new call options but we didn't. We weren't able to write enough call options fast enough to to guard from you know the the almost you know hundred uh, percent discretion of value. Mm. Transocean is still a, around. It's still a very viable company. It's the largest company uh, offshore drilling company in the world. It's probably the most uh, uh, you know recognized and sophisticated fleet. So it is clearly the leader in the sector. But the sector has really gone through some very, very tough times. And unfortunately, you know, our investors suffered through many of those tough times. So mm. um, maybe I should uh, just point out a few particulars. Uh, at the time of our investment, RIG had about a billion dollars of net debt, which was fairly modest, modest relative to its market cap was in the low uh, $20 billion range. So it wasn't a highly leveraged company. Yep. It was trading at a, a relatively modest for, forward uh, EV to EBITDA multiple, and I don't know if that if that's a a multiple that your listeners are familiar with, but it's basically taking the enterprise value of a company, which is its market value, plus the the value of its uh, debt less its cash. That's the enterprise value, and dividing that by the kind of operating cash flow or one one measure of cash flow that companies uh, generate. And so it was not trading at a very high multiple. Um, and against this backdrop, backdrop, excuse me, the industry was the utilization rates for for uh, the various assets in the industry was very very high at the time. So uh, the contract uh, durations were long, day rates were high. Companies were just throwing off massive amounts of cash. Um, there were a lot. It was a very fragmented industry. There were many players. Uh, the The fleet was quite old. Uh, there had been very few uh, uh, very few assets had been scrapped when we first were moving into this in, into this and investment. One thing I would yes, add, I think the backdrop too is that. If it's 2006, you were getting into it. Oil price was rising high, exactly. you know, and so environment was fantastic. Oh yeah, it was a great, you know, again, not a lot of debt, comfortable uh, multiple of earnings, and uh, the industry dynamics looked strong. This was the number one company. It was starting to pay dividends. It took a while before dividends uh, came in. They bought another competitor, uh, GSF, and. Uh, you know, it just looked like this would be a great investment uh, going forward. So what happened? What went wrong? Well, a, a number of things went wrong. The first problem was the global financial crisis. So to give you a, just to, to put things in perspective, um, in June of 2008, oil was at $140 a barrel. By February of 2009, uh, it had dropped to $39 a barrel. So that led to companies like, you know, it hurt the entire, you know, first of all, the globe like suffered a major dislocation, but, you know, oil companies suffered and rig went from a high of $163. So there was a point in time where we actually had a gain on our, we had a good, a decent return on investment, but it dropped to the low forties by early 2009. So I think that was really uh, due to, it wasn't, it was more uh, against this macroeconomic backdrop as opposed mm. to looking at you know something that the company did wrong or something within the industry per se. Nothing really changed within the industry. And, and that's one of the reasons why we stayed in the investment. We didn't say, oh my goodness, you know, the fundamentals have changed. Yes, oil prices have dropped. We've had the you know, SNL crisis and you know, you know, property crisis and all these things that have taken place in the US, but but the the fundamentals for the offshore drilling space still appeared sound as far as we were concerned. And again, and, as I mentioned earlier, the fleet itself was quite old and there was a need for scrapping to take place. So we felt that a number of the older assets would have would be scrapped. Now, during this time when there were uh, when the the companies in the sector were doing quite well and were flush with cash, 
they did go on a, a, a new building spree. And so the, the, the new build order book did start to grow during this time frame. And I was hopeful, as I believe many investors were at the time, that you'd have this transition. Many of the older rigs would be scrapped and the newer ones would come in. So you wouldn't necessarily see a massive increase in the overall size of the offshore drilling fleet. So to summarize where things are at this point, like basically, okay, we got in at 80, but you know things came down. Now we're at 40. It's understandable. Oil prices have absolutely collapsed. This company has survived that collapse. And yes. if somebody was coming to this company right now and they could buy it at 40, it's going to be a great deal. I think exactly. that's so. So, okay. So things seem to be, so, you know, it just get, it, was, was, it was a big macro hit, but yeah. Ahead. But, you know, we're value investors and we felt that, you know, even though the stock had suffered, it, you know, we were hopeful and believed that the outlook was good. So what was the second problem? The second problem was the 2010 deep water explosion in the Gulf of Mexico. And that was a transocean rig. So that really upset the apple cart and really, not only did it hurt the entire industry, but it really, in particular, it really weighed on Transocean. So that, and I didn't put down the, the impact it had on the stock price, but uh, uh, I mean, it clearly had a very significant impact on that pr the price. I just didn't uh, note it um, mm. for your listeners, but that had a huge impact. And that was really, again, it's a one-off and there's nothing you could have done to anticipate that sort of event right uh, or the the ramifications of that and it wasn't just the event it's what it, it impact it had on the entire industry and how people and how politicians viewed offshore drilling and the risks the environmental risks and so it, that really just it, it, again it took the stock down and the valuation down another you know another chunk down and from where it had been you know even though we were starting to recover from the global financial crisis and then boom this hit again so, and, you know, it was another body blow. And can I ask a question about that? Because I think, you know, as an outsider, whether you're an analyst, a fund manager, an, an analyst at a fund management company, you only have so much information. Now, it's possible that an insider may be predicting that something could go wrong or could have seen that, okay, we're slipping on our safety or whatever that, you know, what that was. But as an outsider, I think there are, you have to accept the fact that there are limits to what we can really know about what's going in, uh, going on inside that company. H how do you see that just so that, you know, I, I'd be curious your thoughts there. Well, Transocean has had a, a, a fantastic safety track record. They were, they are, they were and continue to be the leading company in the offshore drilling space. They have mm -hmm. the most sophisticated assets. And uh, the thing is, when you look at, in the case of the Deepwater Horizon, the the operator when they talk when they refer to the operators, they're actually the oil companies, and it was British Petroleum that was operating the rig. So they were actually, even though the rig was owned by Transocean and it was their crew, the operator was British Petroleum. So British Petroleum ultimately uh, faced the the most significant liability, like I you know eighty or ninety percent of the total cost of that oil spill was borne by British Petroleum because they were the ones operating the rig. They were directing Transocean in certain respects, you know, their personnel, what to do and what steps they were going to take as far as, you know, their drilling and the, the, mm. the, the production that they were, you know, things that they were doing at the time, the, it was really uh, directed by British Petroleum. So that's why they were the ones that were more, uh, that faced the highest liability. But other than that, and again, it was very misfortunate. It was it was tragic, yep. um, and it was. But again, it was very much a one-off tragic event, you know. And those things do happen, and you have. That's why we have portfolios, right? That's why we don't have one hundred percent of our investment in any one stock. <laughs> but that's the sort of thing you can't. I, I believe you can't anticipate. Um, so there's a few other problems that 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 took oh. place. The third, um, and I believe I have the dates correct, but in March of 2020. Uh, you had the Saudi Arabia Russian oil price war that kicked in when Saudi Arabia and, and Russia were, you know, duking it out in glo in the global commodity markets as far as you know who was going to control the the price of oil, and that really tanked the oil price for a period of time. And 
when you look at offshore drilling and the, the oil majors, you know, their ability to invest in the future, you know, it, you know, they're long, long lead times. And, and a lot of these deep water uh, oil fields take, you know, tens of billions of dollars to develop. So it's a, it's a long-term investment proposition, but when you've got this kind of oil price war taking place or other mac macroeconomic headwinds, when those events take place, it shakes the confidence and it, it might delay some of these very significant investments that, that the oil majors are looking at. Mm -hmm. And so again, that weighs on utilization rates, day rates, and you know, ultimately the, 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 the share price of a company like TransOcean, because you know, the oil majors are backing up and saying, wait, I'm, you know, maybe we're not gonna you know, tie up this rig for, for two years at you know, $450,000 a day. Let's 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 wait for six months and see how mm. things shake out. So that was a third problem, and ultimately the the fourth problem was the global pandemic. And as we all know, I'm sure your listeners know, you had such a complete and sudden demand destruction. It it ultimately led to uh, the price of oil dropping into for a brief period of time into negative territory. I mean, literally, oil prices were negative. <laughs> so, you know. Oil majors were not looking to be drilling offshore in the you know deep water Gulf of Mexico or offshore Brazil or other places in the world because you know it just it didn't make sense and you know the world was on hold. So those were the four main kind of uh, abrupt um, uh, shocks to the system that really weighed on Transocean and investor sentiment in the stock, and 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 just also. Uh, I think it's important to point out that we also had the shale revolution that was kind of taking place throughout this time frame. It was like more of a slow revolution, but it was a very significant one. And I've seen studies that show that um, had it not been for the shale revolution, that oil prices would potentially been up to 36% higher than, than they, they were. Be, you know, because of the shale revolution, it kind of brought, you know, because of the, the success that the U.S. EMP companies had, yep. particularly in like the Permian Basin in Texas and uh, uh, New Mexico, that that, you know, huge increase in, in oil output on shore, you know, a lot of oil majors were like saying, well, maybe we don't need to like start doing as much EMP uh, activity in these deep water regions where it is ultimately more expensive. We can just go mm. and tap in the, the shale, you know, take advantage of the shale and the fracking. And uh, that's where we're gonna get a better return on investment. Which I would, so I would say that, I thought memory serves me correct. It's probably about the time that Trump came into office that that revolution was kind of hitting its peak production. Yes, I would say it's, it's hitting peak. Yeah. It had been okay. going on for a number of years, but yep. it really hit its peak. And, but then with, uh, with that Saudi Arabia Russian uh, price war, uh, uh, a lot of those wells were shut in, and and with the Biden administration, you know, and the pandemic, it really uh, led to a very significant drop in in output, and, as well as, uh, you know, the number of rigs that were drilling on shore dropped tremendously. So the total output of uh, production in the U.S. domestically on shore dropped quite significantly. And that's one of the things that you can do in the in the shale, the fracking and shale plays. You can turn on and off these uh, these rigs a lot uh, more readily, more readily than you can, let's say, the, the oil sands in Canada or the offshore, you know, deep water fields. So Those are wanna, meant to be on just kind of continuously. Right. I want to go through this just uh, because you've laid it out very clearly. Let's just say the share price starts at eighty dollars, let's just say, roughly, and GFC hits the global financial crisis. That brings it down by about, from 80 to about 40, roughly. Then, then in 2010, deep water horizon, what was the share price kind of roughly after that? Uh, I have to look here. Um, in 2010, so it it the stock went back up into the low 80s yep maybe up, uh, upwards of 80 or 90 yep and then with the deep water it went from that 80 dollar range and then it dropped back down to like 20 or 30 dollars okay so then it was at 20 or 30 and then it managed to survive 
the deep water. And then we have the shale revolution. I'm going to call that point two two a So the shale mm -hmm. revolution brought the share price down further or flat or? So yeah, there was a recovery. The stock dropped immediately after the deep water horizon. Then it went back up um, and then it's been on this. Where, where, where was it after deep water when it recovered from deep water roughly? Uh, so I'm looking at here. So back around uh, January of 2011, it was back around $80. Okay. okay. And then from that point, it pretty much continued a long <laughs> and steady slide down. Uh, and again, against this backdrop, you have to if look at the, the, the structure of the industry. You had mm. a lot of these older uh, second generation, third generation, fourth, fifth, you know, the sixth generation, the, the, the floaters, and you have the jackups, you have all these different fleets, you have a you had a very large, um, a very uh, a legacy fleet that was very old and hard to maintain. Mm. But a lot of those rigs, the owners were looking to deploy those to get them contracted because otherwise they're either warm stacked or cold stacked. And it's it there's a cost involved in warm stacking a rig. There's a there's mm. a more significant st uh, cost in cold stacking a rig, and to get those rigs back in in production also there's a cost involved to do that as well so a lot of these industry players were holding out hope that if they just were able to withstand a little more pain you know eventually they could get these rigs back in service and start generating return on investment so what but it what i'm yeah. trying to understand now is what was the what was the final nail in the coffin that caused the slide down you know to to one dollar or less or whatever uh well, it's been this, this, it's been many years for this hope for recovery to take place that hasn't, mm. even to this day, clearly taken hold. So every step along the way when market watchers, investors like ourselves were anticipating that, okay, we've seen the bottom and now things are going to turn. There's either been a, a, a huge macro shock or it's just been this long, steady um, you know, malaise that's taken mm. place where the players, the utilization rates have remained depressed. So as long as you see utilization rates of the rigs, if there's a large number of rigs available, warm stacked or cold stacked, it's very difficult to see rates, day rates increasing until right. you start seeing utilization rates pop up to, you know, that more like 80 to 90% range. So until you see that, you know, with, and you've got, you know, there's debt obligations. And so these companies are not like debt free. So they're, they're, they're losing money. They're not generating positive returns on investments. So it's kind of a, it's just tiny, a Chinese water torture, so to speak. Yep. And yep. it's taken a number of years, but it's just weight on the company and on the sector. We've had a number of bankruptcies. We've had an, uh, the, the industry has consolidated. Uh, th some companies have reemerged from bankruptcy. Their their debts have been restructured, and so you've got new cre creditors that are now shareholders, and all of this has had an impact, particularly on the Transocean, because Transocean never went through that formal restructuring the way like a C drill and others did. Mm. They get a clean sheet; they don't have the debt overhang, but they still have the rigs, and so the rigs are waiting and trying to get employed. And the operators are seeing like, hey, we we don't have to pay the four hundred fifty thousand dollars a day that we once paid, we can pay 300,000. Well, if you're paying 300,000, given the costs, you know, the capital that you've got investment, $300,000 is better than zero, but it's not generating, you're not generating positive economic returns on investment that you, that you need to see a stock price, not only, you know, staying, you know, seeing a stock price increase in value. It's not going to happen until you get higher rates of return and you won't get those higher rates until you see utilization rates improve. So I just pulled up the share price and I can see why it's a little bit difficult to kind of nail down what, you know, but I, I'm going to include the share price, a picture of the share price in the show notes. So for those people interested in kind of watching the chronology, we'll have that in the show notes. I think it's, it's good now to, to, to walk into the, the, the part of this podcast where we ask, what did you learn? Uh, okay. Well, um, I would say that, that, um, you know, investments can turn sour despite any and all attempts to, to fully understand a company and an industry. So you just got to realize that, you know, and I hate to, you know, 
cuss, but you know, shit happens. It really it happens. does. So it just, you, you, you have to anticipate that there are going to be unforeseen events. So despite your best, you know, best laid plans that still things can go wrong. So you have to take that into account when you are investing. And that's why, you know, one of the main reasons why investors should always have a portfolio. Um, I think another important uh, lesson is that hubris is, is probably your worst enemy. And mm -hmm. a lot of investors, you know, investors are smart people. You know, a lot of these hedge fund guys, Ackerman, all these other people, they're really, really smart. But I think oftentimes that can be to their detriment, because if you think you've got all the answers and you know more than anyone else, that you're not going to you know, listen to, to different views. You're not going to, to make your investments in such a manner that, that uh, you, know, you anticipate that you might be getting things wrong or that these other you know, events outside of your control, like the Deepwater Horizon, can actually take place. So you have to anticipate and, and realize that you, you really don't have all the answers. So that's the second thing. And uh, I'd say, finally, you always should take steps to de-risk your positions. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we sell options, constantly using options to generate income and to de-risk our positions. You also should, on occasion, resort to timely sales. Uh, I'm not saying trade in and out of positions, but I, on occasion, you might want to take some uh, capital off the table. And then dividends. Dividends are always in something that you don't want to, you know, they're not unimportant. Mm. Uh, and so it's a way of de-risking your positions and bringing back some return on your investment. So those are probably my three, uh, you know, lessons that I learned at least from <laughs> this yeah. trans-ocean investment. So let me, uh, I, I want to go into that a little bit, just because I think there's a lot, there's, you know, really good lessons. So you've talked that shit happens and got to be diversified, just foundational risk management, you've got to have mm -hmm. in place. Number two is hubris, hubris, or just, you know, the confidence that comes with being an analyst, you know, and analyzing, you know, you naturally are trying to find stories that you can build confidence. And as we went through this story, it kind of flashed me back where I remember some encounters with you and maybe some emails or something at where I came across your, your, um, your confidence in the industry, you know, in, in drilling and in, you know, that whole industry. And it just kind of reminded me of that. And, and that, that gets me to the question I have is that, so the question I have is like, what could you do that? What could you have done differently? I mean, you did a lot of things right. There was a lot of different environmental things that just hit global financial crisis, deep water horizon, you know, that type of stuff. But what, what is one or two things that you think back and think, yeah, I should have at this point done that? Uh, I wish I had the answer. <laughs> I, I really don't know because I'd like to second guess and think back, you know, what would I have done that, uh, different, but I really don't, you know, unfortunately, I think I probably would have done the same thing yeah. if the same sort of, you know, circumstances were to present itself again. I, I wish that, you know, that weren't the case, <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, I still think Transocean, you know, is poised at some point to recover. Now that might, it's trading in the $3 range. So maybe it goes to nine or $10, you know, so from here as a new investor, you might get a, a decent return on investment. But looking at it now, so mm. as, just to point out this stock again now, the other thing that does concern me now that it does have a pretty significant amount of, of net debt relative right. to its market value. So there is still, there is now, rel relative to when I first invested, there's a lot more financial risk in the stock than there was when we first invested. But you know, maybe we should have just cut our losses earlier. Um, and redeployed our capital um, at an earlier point in time, mm. but yep. uh, unfortunately, I didn't do it, and yep. Uh, yep. to the detriment of our investors. Yeah. So let me uh, let me summarize some of the takeaways. I mean, I think that it was a great uh, summary of what you said. Shit happens, you know, overconfidence, and and also the lesson of de-risking your position. Uh, I think what I want to highlight is, is your answer to the last question. And that is, I'm not really sure. You know, I, th I think I did most things right. And I probably would do it the same way. And I wrote down when you said that, 
for the listeners out there who want to be a fund manager or investor, bad news. You're going to lose. You are going to lose despite your best efforts. Absolutely. And I think that this is really a lesson in that. And if you understand that right from the beginning, first, it makes, then you make sure that you have a risk management in place. So that's the first thing. I think many people will go in thinking, I'm not going to, I mean, I'm doing all the work. I'm doing a lot of effort here. I've got a lot of good information, but sorry, you're going to lose. And I think that's kind of my number one takeaway. I think um, at the end of this podcast, I always end by saying, you know, by listening to these stories, it helps us to create, grow, and protect our wealth. I always say that we create wealth through either our job, maybe you get a good salary and you don't spend as much of it and you can invest every single month. That's like creating wealth every single month. Or you've got a business and you're generating cash flow. That's another way of creating wealth. Growing wealth, we do in the stock market generally, you know, or in other people's businesses, let's say, or, or in government bonds. You know, some people are just going to say, I'm going to you know, grow my wealth in a very slow way. And then the third one is protect our wealth. And that's what this podcast is all about. And I think that I just want to highlight that, you know, there's core principles in place for anybody who's building a portfolio. And that is particularly the diversification. The second thing that you've talked about is how can we de-risk this portfolio? And, you know, it's given me some, some thoughts about the, you know, what I'm managing here and thinking about it. And so, um, and then the last thing I put down, and, and this is kind of a wimpy, final point, and that is get different opinions. But I think that it's really hard to do. Like what, who would have come to you with a, an informed opinion on the topic and have convinced you that it's time to get out of this? I just don't see that that would have been the case. But, you know, we try to get opposing views. But when you think you've done the research, part of what makes this fund manager successful is to say, no, I'm, I'm against the opposing view. So that's how I would summarize um, what, what I've learned. Is there anything you would add to that? Well, I, I do have a partner and we debated Transocean many times over the years. And, you know, looking back, he was clearly right. You know, he was against, you know, the, the, the position as it soured, you know, didn't think it was going to recover. And I kept pushing that, you know, I think it, you know, it will. And these are all the reasons why I think it stands to recover or, you know, it just was down because of the spill or because of the macro this or the macro that. And so, you know, I had my arguments and he had his, his arguments. And, um, you know, there were times when we we reduced the position, but, you know, ultimately when our, our last sales were at a fraction of, of, of the initial, you know, stock price that when we first, you know, moved in in 2006. So it was a, a rather painful episode mm. and, you know, and in a fund that, again, overall, we've made, you know, quite good returns on investment. Yep. Our investors have generated, you know, close to 9% mm. uh, returns. Well, even going back to two, uh, March of 2000, we first started the fund. So yep. on average, we've generated very, you know, steady, positive returns on investment. So yes, we had, you know, and, and TransOcean is not the only investment that's gone bad, but you have to, you have to have conviction. You have to do your research, but, regardless of how smart you are and how much homework you do, things can go wrong, have a portfolio, de-risk, and, and don't let one bad investment weigh on your, you know, on your psyche, you, you, you know, yeah. you're, you're always going to have those kind of investments and just continue to plug away. And I think over time, you'll be rewarded. Every investor, if you invest wisely, you invest in value, you take some of these steps that I've outlined. Um, I yeah. think you'll, you'll be looking at positive returns on investment. It makes me think about uh, for my first 10 years in Thailand, I was riding motorcycles a lot and I had different motorcycles. And uh, that's and a then, fairly risky proposition. <laughs> that's a very risky proposition. And, and uh, when I sold my motorcycles and got out of that, that game, I, somebody asked me, you know, whenever I see anybody buying a motorcycle, they, you know, we, I talked to them, I just say, look, it's not a question of if it's a question of when you're going to have an accident. It is not a question of it, particularly for those people listening and viewing who know Bangkok traffic. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so, you know, it's the same thing with investing. You know, it's not a question of, you know, oh, if, if you're going to lose, you are going to lose. And you've got to, 
be prepared for that. So based on what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, let's go back in time. Let's imagine a young person now facing a similar situation. What one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Uh, well, uh, you had actually asked me earlier about uh, what um, lessons or, or what uh, advice I would give investors. So let me turn your question around a little bit. Mm. One thing that's really helped me over the years, and I remember distinctly, I don't know the exact date. I do recall though, it was in 1985. I, I, I subscribed to the Wall Street Journal. And I have literally, from that day forward, I have never, I've read every single issue cover to cover from that date in 1985 till today. And if I'm on a vacation for a week or two, I'll have a stack of Wall Street journals and I'll sit for hours and I'll go through all the stories. And, you know, some of it's, you know, personal finance and, you know, movies, this and that, but there's politics, there's macroeconomics, and there's, there's, there's a lot of information about businesses. And I think it's a really, really useful tool. And, and, and I highly recommend that investors read as much as possible. And the Wall Street Journal is a great source. It could be the Financial Times, it could mm -hmm. be other publications, but I think doing as much research as possible, learning as much as you can about companies and industries, macroeconomic conditions, uh, global events, it'll really, um, it'll really help you when it comes to putting together your own investments and your own portfolio. Well, that's the first time we've had that recommendation. I think it's a great one. <clears throat> and for the listeners out there, you know, find that- you know, Over 600 visits and or 600 uh, yep. Calls and not one person is not recommended, person is recommended that. Nope, wow. you're the first. And I think that the lesson for the listeners is that, you know, find your reliable source of good financial information, whether that's the FT or I also really enjoy the economists and some of the articles, you know, particularly the, exactly. their summaries of research and stuff and Wall Street Journal also. But find that source and dedicate yourself to learning on a daily basis. And I think that if you do that, that's super valuable. So yeah, last I mean, we have we have Bloomberg, but Bloomberg is you know it's not something that most your your listeners can afford to pay unless they're in the industry. So yep. I wouldn't you know that's not something I could really recommend. Last question: mm -hmm. what What is your number one goal for the next twelve months? To pre preserve the capital in our fund. Uh, so at the, again, most important thing is not lose money for our investors. We are actually down uh, this year. We are outperforming the S&P as a whole, but our goal is to, to, to not lose money and to earn positive rates of return on investment. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to do that this year, but that's our goal. Yep. Preserve yep. the wealth of our investors. We are stewards uh, and you know that's our number one priority is to protect the capital that people have, have uh, you know, they've given us the opportunity. And it's, it's quite a distinction to have people yep you know, give, you know, their, their net worth, like here, you know, please help us manage this for our retirement. Cause we invested our own assets, my partner and I significant portion of our net worth is tied up in our fund. So yep. we gain and lose money along with our other limited partners. And I've seen, I've seen and, and received your email for many years and, you know, despite, you know, mistakes or frustrations like Transocean as an example, your performance has been excellent. And it's also a very steady performance, which is not the same as, you know, a lot of others. So I think, uh, is there a place that, that is there a, a website or someplace that I can send people that are interested that want to look at it more? Uh, well, if you can always direct people to me by email, but yep. we don't, unfortunately, we're pretty small and yep. Uh, yep. we don't have all the bells and whistles and the marketing team and all that other stuff that goes along yep. with most large hedge funds. We're, we're pretty small Keep by design. Simple. Keep it simple, but yeah, yep. we're more than happy to talk to people. Yep. If so if anybody's, if anybody's interested, because Lance is also another interesting guy in that he doesn't have all these social media places and all these different ways of contacting so if you want to uh, learn more, just let me know and I'll put you in touch. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. If you haven't yet joined the Become a Better Investor community, just go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now to claim your spot. As we conclude, Lance, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? 
no, but uh, thank you very much for your time, Andrew. And uh, I wish everyone best of luck uh, this coming year. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Fantastic. And ladies and gentlemen, that was a masterclass in understanding about investing, the upside, the downside, how to understand risk, and the reality that shit does happen. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today we added one more person, Lance, to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.